Hey, Happy New Year. This is Benjamin Boyce. I am continuing with my project of dismantling the dismantlers who are alive and well in our institutions of higher learning. Today I was sent uh, a article by Cave Dweller at Celtic Tribal on Twitter that links to an article that links to an edited video about this professor named Albert Ponce, or Albert Ponce. And eventually, after some digging, I came to the actual video of him giving a lecture titled White Supremacy in the USA um, by Albert Ponce, PhD, political science uh, associate professor at Diablo Valley College in California, I believe. He graduated from UCLA, yeah, UCLA, and this talk was given on October 26th, 2017. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the first part of the video and the last part of the video. The lecture is like an hour and 20 minutes, and I'm just going to do the introduction. I'm going to go through the introduction in Benjamin Boy style, and then I'm going to go through the Q&A in Benjamin Boy style. And if you want to see the whole thing, and if you want me to try to go through the whole thing, maybe I will, but you can look up the link in the description down below, all those little things that um, provide you ways of supporting me in this endeavor that is uh, multifaceted and continuously ongoing. So here we go. Um, so today I want to provide three things. We're going to begin by providing a conceptual framework, a little bit of theory to think about what this means and where does it begin? Where is it histor historical specific location? Secondly, I want us to focus today on the trajectory of Western political thought and how thought and ideas that were privileged as primary and above all other forms of thinking for thousands of years have placed one people supreme above all other and relegated other forms of knowing as folklore or non-existent or completely eradicated from the planet from our historical record and we don't even house them here at our university because here this is a space where we per perpetuate this system and the knowledge production and what we teach you all. It emanates from here. So he wants to cast the dominant culture as having to do with race, and I think that we can completely reject that. It just has to do with certain sorts of value sets or a certain way of viewing the world. And there are certain manners of engaging with the world that will lead to more technological advancement than other ways of seeing the world. Now, he wants to say that all ways of seeing the world are valid, and some are less valid than others, and that the dominant one has been valid for so long, but is actually actually just as valid and just as subjective as the other ones. And he's saying that again by taking advantage of everything that this dominant culture gave him or these dominant value sets gave him. And I think some of the foundational properties of this are not tied to race. It's just basic organization skills, just an enshrining of order and kind of a sense that there is the realm of feeling and the realm of reality. And there's, there's two distinct way, things that are going on. There's the subject and the objective. And if I approach the world as though it is separate than me and has its own laws that are independent of my feelings about it, then I can start to make decisions and find ways of acting that will benefit me in the long term because I'm not blinded by short-term thinking. And that doesn't mean that everything that is non-Western is inherently emotional, but his proposition, we'll get to his proposition for an alternative to Western rationality is complete power play, is completely based on that power dynamic. And I think that the problem with power is that how do you regulate that if you can't talk about that? And if you can't have a rational discussion where you talk through these different ways of being and organize your thoughts and say, okay, there's the facts and then there's the phenomenon or there's the feels and the reels or whatever. Once you make that distinction, then we can start to you know, each kind of hold back our own opinion, our own want for power, and kind of start to try to objectively view that which is between us, that which can potentially operate for the both of ours betterment. And after, we will have time for questions. That's what I want the most excited about. Once we critically analyze and think about what it means, how can we make sense of our world? How can we make our world better? 
So he says the word critically analyze, and we all know this by now, that by critically analyze, he doesn't mean by seeing it in different views. He means seeing it in the critical theory view, which should go without saying at this point. But, you know, we need to kind of interpret what he's actually saying um, from what he is saying. So we begin with the fact that we exist in a white supremacist, patriarchal, heteronormative capitalist system. We begin with the fact that we live in a white supremacist, patriarchal, heteronormative system. Now, what does he mean by the term fact? He means by the assumption. This is his axiom. This is not a fact. This is that which cannot be questioned. This is his supposition. It's not a fact. But he's using the word fact, so it seems like this is reality. But it's not. It's his version of reality. There is a hierarchical form, order of domination in society based on multiple identities that we all carry. And to top that all off, there is a hierarchy of identity. So all hierarchy is based on identity. And I would say that's not true. I would say that hierarchy is based on ability. And he goes on to, def to better support my definition than his. Whether you are a woman, whether you are a person of color, whether you are lesbian, gay, transsexual, etc. Whether you are disabled, and right now you're feeling the brunt of that coming into this room, because this room was not made for those who are not able-bodied. That's power. That is the system. And subconsciously, we don't, or consciously, we might be aware of it, but how is this room restructured to enable those who do not have the physical capacity to enter into this privileged space and enact forms of dialogue while engaging in some of these big ideas? So he says that hierarchies are formed out of identity, and then he goes on for his most, uh, I think probably the best example he can give of that is the identity of disabled, right? Which I would say, well, why don't you just cut the chase and say that hierarchies are formed out of those who can actualize their potential within any given game or any given rule set. Now, the thing is, is that if he wants to actually dis demolish all forms of power, it's not going to be possible because let's just say that we live in this amazing world where somebody can talk into a video camera and you don't have to actually be in the physical place with them. But if you're listening to somebody in this magical hypothetical world through a video interface, let's say, let's say there's a website and let's call it YouTube and there's somebody speaking to you through YouTube, these ideas, they are still enforcing a certain sort of power dynamic according to his uh, his definition because you would one you would have to have a cortex that's strong enough to support the ability to decode language two you would have to have the ability to hear the language as well as the technology to get there so let's say yeah let's not even add you even have to have the technology to do that this is all these ableist propositions and then thirdly you have to have the ability to understand english so there's already a power that only those who are one have brains that can decode language, two, have ears that can hear language, three, have the ability to be in a place to receive the, t the language, and then four, being able to understand the specific language itself. And then secondly, he says that everything's a hierarchy, everything's power, right? And then he's already trying to dominate, I'll use their terms, he's already trying to colonize our way of thinking with his way of thinking, right? So they talk about decolonization. That doesn't mean the stripping down of the power structure. That means the regulation of all power structures through a specific rule set. And that's basically, we all know this, but it's all about the oppressor and the oppressed, and the oppressor and the oppressed, and the oppressor and the oppressed, and the oppressor and the oppressed. And that's going to collapse under its own weight. Which is amazing that something that's this full of contradiction has made it this far into the academy, that it's being promulgated again and again and again across all of higher education. And then, you know, people worry like, why do people not like higher education anymore? What are we doing wrong in our society that like all these people don't like higher education? And then you go look at higher education. America's evil and filled with white supremacists and we need to, to dismantle everything and everybody's evil except for us. And like, okay, well maybe, you know, what's the cause and effect here going on? But, sorry to get snarky, let's, let's continue. So these spaces, the university, the college, were not built for everyone. Reality wasn't built for everyone. They were built on a model that descends from Europe, transposed 
to the Americas with the modern colonial universities, the first one in Mexico City, the second in Lima. Those were the centers of conquest. Okay, so he wants to critique this university. But the thing is that, that this system survives and perpetuates because it's effective. And he, he wants to completely deny the effectualness of universities and all the good that they've done. Why would he possibly want to do that other than to gain power? other than to use his critique to somehow say that, well, yeah, the system is bad, but if I was in control of the system, I can make it good. Or we were in control of the system, we can make it good. But what are you going to provide that's better than the system? I'm going to let him answer this, but I'll give you a hint. He has no solutions other than violence. This is all he has to offer. The, uh, from, from the Spanish Empire. And they didn't build those institutions there in Mexico City and in, in Peru or Lima with the ideas from indigenous knowledge. No, they just imported Western Eurocentric forms of knowing as hegemonic as this is what is worth knowing. So I just want to ask the question, and anybody, please raise your hand. When you see the term, these two term words put together, very popular now, they're everywhere, everybody's talking about it. White supremacy, what is it? What does it mean? All right. I'm going to fast forward now because he says, what does white supremacy means? He shows a bunch of pictures of lynchings and uh, that, that Spencer dude who's a white supremacist. And he says, he shows that. He's like, we all think this. We all think this. We all think this, right? No, the problem's much bigger. The problem's much bigger than that. It's not just that. that that's laying them off easy. Saying that they're a bunch of ignorant, murderous people is letting them off easy. No, it's deeper than that. The problem is deeper. But I still think that he wants to maintain the stigma of white supremacy, of like racism but in its most ugly forms. They want, these people want to maintain the punch of white supremacy, but then enlarge that to include everyone. And then here we go with some quotes that he has. White supremacy is the unnamed, but they're naming it right there, is the unnamed political system that has made the modern world system what it is today. Presumably, they only want to change the bad things. Presumably. So his second quote is, white supremacy is a social and political order of domination and subordination that systematically generates and upholds inequalities of wealth, power, and prestige by privileging racialized whiteness over and above all categories of racial identity. Now, I would say that the solution to this definition, to white supremacy, is to decouple certain sort forms of behavior that are successful from a race. And that's how you get, and for my proof, I'm going to say what are similar between the model minorities and the white people, right? It's basically, I would say, you could basically say that there's certain people who find spreadsheets sexy. There's certain people who work really hard and like to have things very orderly. And you can say that, that basically Asian people and then Jewish people and then white people and not even all of those people, but like the dominant, the ascendant uh, people or the ascendant cultures, I would say, have espoused certain values that work better than other values. And maybe that's why he doesn't have any solutions, because you can't actually change the fact that he who is organized will always win against he who is unorganized. Maybe you can't actually change that problem, but still wanting to use that problem, misconstrue that problem as some sort of racial thing, and then make these racist statements and basically say that, that you need to destroy everything white, and what is white? Everything's successful, and so what are we going to do? We're going to destroy all that, and magically, somehow things are going to be better without running water, and electricity, and technology, and innovation, and all that other stuff. It's kind of rather uncomfortable to talk about this, right? Because if I'm anti-anti-white supremacy, then like the easiest thing to say about me is that I am pro-white supremacy. To be against this definition of white supremacy is very difficult for me to distance myself from those who are for white supremacy. And I'm not for that. I think that that is a completely 
It's just not a cool way to act. It's a very shallow way of interacting with humanity, interacting with the world, putting our container, putting any other category ahead of one, that I'm a human being, and two, I'm Benjamin Boyce. And then after all that comes my, my various containers, which are no less real and don't not have effect in the world and don't not give me certain privileges or something like that. But if I strive to be the best human I can and strive to see everybody else as a human being first and then a self secondly, and then see how all that stuff interrelates with, you know, all these other categories, then I think I'll be much better off than the people who put these categories over the human and over the self. In other words, I think this is a form of idolatry that is doomed to fail. And by fail, I mean create a whole lot of drama that is not going to do anybody any good. This is where I'm going to pause and travel into the future. Well, his future, which is our past, and his past too, because he's still alive. And not that I want that to change. Um, and I shouldn't even say that, so I'll edit that out later, because somebody's gonna misconstrue everything I say. We go all the way ahead to where the clapping is. And he ends with a picture of President Trump. Which is, like, perfect. Because Trump is Hitler. Yes. Questions? So the first question is, what do we do with all this knowledge? How do we change the world according to all the evil things that you pointed out to us about the world? How do we change it? This is his answer. So this is, and this is what's great about these universal maxims, which we're referencing here, which they left us dangerously at the table. Now they become our weapons to dismantle them, right? But we have to become empowered as students, as those in the community, and how to utilize and turn and realize the potential. So maybe they're not so good. Huh? Maybe they're not so good. But as students, and that's the question, what do we do here at UBC? What do we do? So you demand of your professors, you demand in your classes, you demand of this institution to change, to be, to decolonize this form of Western hegemony in all the disciplines. Because as it stands, we have white history, we have white political science, we have white philosophy, we have white physics. We have white physics. Do physics operate depending on your race? That's a question I have for him. He's just, one, it's ridiculous, right? White physics? He doesn't say white math. He probably has never taken a physics course since he got out of undergrad. Well, he definitely hasn't gotten, uh, did anything after undergrad. Um, white physics. But what he's just done is make made a racial designation upon all of epistemology. All forms of knowing that are promulgated by the university are inherently racist, which is the most racist thing you can say. And, and by racist, the only thing I mean by that is, again, it's absolutely stupid, absolutely shallow. It, it allows you to be a bigot. It allows you to just dismiss everything out of hand and say, well, that's all white. There's got to be something better than the whiteness. There's got to be something better than the whiteness because look at all the things that white, the white culture has erased in all of history and look at all these forms of indigenous knowledge that got, that got beat out by these white forms of knowledge. Maybe there are better forms of knowledge. Maybe if you have a Petri dish with a bunch of different bacteria, a certain bacteria with a certain skill set is going to dominate the Petri dish. Right? And I'm not talking about race, I'm talking about culture. I'm talking about ways of viewing the world and not to say that there are not there's not room for multiple ways of seeing the world, which I think he wants to say that there are different ways of seeing the world and we can, we can invent a way to interact with each other where we respect our differences and where people with different ways of seeing the world can have some sort of constructive, valid sort of traction with how the world operates and how the world is run. But you're not gonna do that by targeting one race, uh, well, targeting one way of thinking and one way of doing things, construing that as racial, and then dismantling that just out of hand without saying, well, there are certain things that this group has, there's certain things that that group has, there's certain things that this group has, but he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to offer solutions. I'm getting ahead of myself. He just wants to diagnose. He just wants to criticize. And by criticize, I mean, just clarify everything in one myopic way of seeing the world. They don't call it that. It is like DDC. They don't call it <laughs> that's what it's called. That's what it is. Let's call it what it is. And to decolonize that and integrate our forms of knowledge, what I mean, our is all of ours. All of ours. 
integrate all of our forms of knowledge. How exactly will that work? Well, one thing you're going to need to do is get rid of the idea that you don't want contradiction. And he's thoroughly done that in his way of thinking. So I guess that's the first step. We'll see how it actually happens that you can integrate all these forms of knowing into one actually constructive way of dealing with the world all together, all as one, and not use the tools that have been given to us that have been proven to unite a bunch of people in various projects. Not to say that there hasn't been bad things going on and not to say that there won't be more bad things going on, but his way of doing things, of just getting rid of the old and in with this brand new system is not going to have the tools inherent to weed out bad actors. It's going to be completely taken advantage of by those who just want power. And if Evergreen has taught us anything or taught me anything is that once you give over to this idea of equity over equality, you have people who will use their statistical uh, disadvantageousness to gain all the advantage for very, you know, basic, very, very stupid gains, very stupid gains, because all they're thinking about is me, 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 feels dominate the moment, but reels perpetuate into the future. And as the Zapatistas and, and Southern Chiapas say, a, where we can create a world in which many different worlds can exist, where each value system emanating from those people, their specific people, their subjectivities are now integrated into the modern colonial capitalist university. And then we can stop calling it what it is, right? And we can start calling it real space for knowledge. Knowledge where we take all the subjectivities into and that's how we begin to decolonize the system. Okay. Um, where we can create a world in which many worlds exist. Where each value system emanating from those people, their specific people, their subjectivities are now integrated into the modern colonial capitalist university. Okay, so this is the thing. He's defeated himself because the modern colonial capitalist university is the one place that's been erected that can possibly handle all these different subjectivities as long as you abide by certain rules, certain basic rules that we're going to talk through differences, that we're going to be open-minded, and that we're going to try to come to a decision based on something that can perpetuate into the future. I would say it's objectivity or rationality or something like that. But you need to have enough of a stable form of organization of the world in order to have the resources for everybody to come to the university and exist together and to suspend their need to eat and survive and fight over resources you need to have an organization of the world that can relieve us so that we can go into this university bubble so that university bubble is the solution or is principally what he even says that's what he wants but he doesn't want to call it that anymore so he wants to just i guess just change the words of it but at the same time, his whole philosophy can't exist without dismantling, without a power struggle. Because like, it's not enough for these subjectivities to come into contact with each other. There still needs to be some sort of power struggle because these, these different subjectivities will only ever be able to ignite an intersectionality through a war against one, one identity. And that goes back to the beginning when he said, when he started listing off all the identities, and you can see that the one identity or set of identities that he did not name is the one that all these other identities need to gang up and say, look at all the things that you've done wrong throughout history. You didn't build a ramp into every room or whatever. And then we can stop calling it what it is, right? And we can start calling it real space for knowledge. We can start calling it real space for knowledge. Knowledge where we take all the subjectivities into, and that's how we begin to decolonize the system. He's just, he's just spitting out rhetoric. This is not a smart man. This is a man who gobbled up a bunch of books and he can quote all the books and he can say it like, like, it's just like there's this biblical thing in the New Testament about the, like the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And I can't remember which or which, but there's one that just like knows the law to the T and can just like spout out the law constantly and not like actually have any sort of individuality within that law or not even be able to connect the moral reality of the law, you know, like the, the law of the Old Testament to the actuality of existence, but instead just uses the law to like change the existence according to whatever the law says but it, in, in a completely non-realistic non-actualized way next question so again another student asks well what can we do what can we do to change this what can we do to act on this 
So today, the, the takeaway, as I mentioned, there's one thing, is to reconceptualize the, the genealogy, what white supremacy means, what is it, right? It's out there, it's a different conception, and it takes away from the actual systemic, the systemic institutional structure of our world. So even if Richard Spencer's gone, it's punched again. You know, the thing is about these people who are complaining about the system, all the systemic problems, the same with Laurier, the same with Evergreen, the same over and over and over again. It's this whole contingent within the college. They're constantly complaining about the system that they are totally benefiting from. This guy is totally benefiting from the system. And for whatever reason, he's trying to teach other people that are paying into the system to dismantle the system. But I think that he's got tenure, like they're usually associate professors, so he doesn't care. Like, you're not actually going to hurt me. You're going to go forth and d d demolish other systems and teach your children to dismiss the system. I want to be fine. I got tenure. I can do whatever I want. I can tell you to destroy the thing that's feeding me. Why would you even do that? I don't understand why he would do that, except for the fact that he gets power by saying this. Except he gets notoriety and power by saying this. That's the only reason I can think of that, and, and it's so short-sighted. It's the same, it's the same caliber of thinking that gives rise to racism. It's 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 shallow and it's short-sighted. And it's it's utterly destructive to deep, meaningful betterment of the world. To just say, the system, the system is wrong. And I'm gonna rethink the system. Well, how do we rethink the system, Bucko? Oh man. So somebody asks about representation, about like there's something in the Constitution that says that no one race can control everything, and yet one race controls everything. And then this is his, uh, this is his answer. I'm thinking about this clause, right? So there are protections even for those in power. And what do we do when there is no representation at the highest level? You mentioned the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is, as, as it stands, it is the last defense of white supremacy where law is the Supreme Court is the last defense of white supremacy, and we all obey the Supreme Court. I don't even know what to say to that. I don't even know what to say to that. And we try to use legal means, but well, okay, hold on. Maybe that's why they're talking about this. Maybe this is why white supremacy is being used, and it's actually the Laurier is going to be having like some sort of like weekend retreat where they're going to try to defeat white supremacy. But like, you're like, what are you even talking about? Like, that's a great, it's a great rhetorical turn because like you knock your opponents off guard by saying, well, everything's white supremacy. You're a white supremacist. And you're like, oh, well, I didn't know I was a white supremacist. Well, I guess I'm going to give up all of my rationality because that's all white supremacists. And therefore, I'll just follow you because you obviously know that everything is white supremacy. It's like that D'Angelo thing with uh, white fragility. Uh, she defines white fragility. Oh, I have it right here. Racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves, right? So she says that white fragility is bad. And every any time that a white person interacts with another person and there's racial stress, they're just going to start defending themselves against attack. The moment that you try to argue against that say, actually, I don't feel fragile and I don't feel I'm being defensive. They're like, no, you're being defensive. You don't even know this. And it's true. You don't even know it. Look at that. You don't even know that you're white supremacist. It's so true. It's so true. It's a fact. He began it. It's a fact. You can't even argue it. And any any type of arguing that you have is going to prove it more. And what's the end game? No wonder they don't have any solutions. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of it. He's going to say this coming up pretty soon here. Now you try to use legal means, but are legal means enough? When the institution, the juridical realm, was an instrument of the oppression of people of color, the nation over, here in California specifically, the institution, of law, when somebody's land is dispossessed, prior to the Homestead Acts, who are they going to turn to? Somebody just takes their land. The legal system? No, the legal system was established in order to make the natives foreigners overnight. That's the beauty of law. Again. That's the beauty of law. Um, it's that's an incredibly cynical view of the law, and not to say that the law cannot be used for means like that, but to say that all of law 
is to be used for that is to basically justify you using any means necessary to gain your own power. To construe all of legal history as just d domination by the dominant of the subdominant or the subordinate to the dominant or whatever is to only ever going to get you anywhere other than justifying your own dominance of other people and to justify your reaction to other people as casting them as oppressing you. In order for us to be human, there has to be a call from within to go on the path of saying, well, what can I do for other people? And so insofar as social justice is a good thing, it comes from the prompt of trying to say there is an equality and we need to remind people that that, that equality can be bridged and that giving to other people and lifting other people up is a much more virtuous activity than assembling and assembling and assembling and only being higher and higher and higher and higher your own self. But the thing is, is that social justice in action is constantly promulgated by people who use it to gain their, to gain their own ascendancy over and over and over and over and over again. And I'm doing this so you guys can see the t-shirt that I have on sale. Um, and if you want to support my channel, you can get a t-shirt like this. But the reality, so what we need to do is just engage. And engage in not like, not in the utopian or almost uh, naive sense. Can we just talk to each other? Can we all get along? Rodney King? No, 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 no. It's going to be, right? All of history is a clashing of opposing forces. We're there now. Which is going to manifest itself and move us forward. If you go back just a bit, here's the clip, but if you go back just a bit, he says that he wants all these different subjectivities coming in and recreating like this Western knowledge base and calling it something else, like freedom land or something else. And then he says, well, but we shouldn't think naively because everything is a clashing of forces. Therefore, you should get your bat and go out into the street. And I'll let him say that. I'll let him say that. But he's constantly contradicting himself. And is that a bug or a feature of his way of thinking? And how far can that perpetuate into the future? If you you want to assemble a bunch of people of different subjectivities, how are you going to do that and still embrace all these conflicts of, of interpretation and say, well, it's all conflict anyways, it's all struggle, it's all clashing against each other, so let's get into the pit, let's dismantle everything and then fight about it. That's his solution. Let's dismantle everything and then fight about it. That's the way to change the world because Trump is evil and I don't like him. Not to say that he's likable guy, he's Trump. But that doesn't excuse going off the deep end. And it's not in this Western hegemonic view, the, the unity taking the Hegel or Marx and thinking about A clashes into, into B and creates C and it's higher understanding. No, 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 that is Western hegemony over our mind. It might be something totally new, right? We're not tossing Marx and Hegel out completely. We're saying, no, no, that is your form of knowledge. And that form of knowing that you're created when, you know, when I'm teaching, Dialectical unity, the opposites, the clashing of these forces. And I'm caught up in that because that's the way I teach it. Then I'm thinking, as many people and philosophers of color are thinking from outside, so space matters, right? If we're outside of. Okay, okay. So he leads himself down this road where he says, well, yeah, the, all of history is clashing forces, but, oh, that's Hegel. So I'm quoting Hegel and we don't want to do Hegel, but, well, we can't let go of Hegel and stuff, but, uh, space matters. There's people outside the box who might have a bigger idea than me because I'm inside the box and I want to get outside the box because I'm teaching you all to dismantle this box. So he's having this moment of realization of what he's teaching, but he can't stop. He can't say, well, actually, uh, this isn't going to work, guys. Oh, no, somebody else is going to have a better idea. There's a messiah outside of the box and it's gotta be like somebody who's got a, a certain amount of melanin in their skin and probably doesn't talk English. So I probably won't understand them. So I'm basically screwed. He's having a total moment of cognitive dissonance, but he, he's I, either he's too idiotic or too blind, which is amounts to the same thing. And I just committed two acts of ableism, but he, he's either deficient in the ability to see into the future or to critically rationalize to the end of his game. So he's deficient in some way. And I'm sorry for using metaphors to carry across that point. See, look how enlightened I am. To continue. In that sense, people are thinking differently from their country, from their specific geography, uh, geographical and the culture and the history and the knowledge that comes from there. So his solution is that there's a Messiah that's in a different place. And there's a Messiah that's in a different color. 
So he thinks that this whole thing is going to be solved by changing races. And that is not true. Everybody can be a tyrant. I'm going to give everybody power right now. Y'all can be complete flaming assholes. And actually, y'all can be absolutely wonderful beings. Y'all can do that. No matter what you are. No matter what container you've been put in. You are free to be however you want. And you're free to make the system better. And if you want to destroy the system, you have to... I would, I would challenge you to give up the system and to do without the system so that you can start to appreciate what the system does. Because if you go around just diagnose everything as ill without a model of health, you're not a doctor. You're not going to fix anything. You need a model of health in order to diagnose what is unhealthy and then to move that which is unhealthy towards health. And, you know, if you want to go around criticizing Western culture with a bunch of Western tools, then you have to say that you're a hypocrite or you have to be freaking genius to do better than what's come before. You have to be a freaking genius. And I think even more than being a genius, you have to be a little humble. And, and being humble, I would say, is to not tell a bunch of young people to go out and destroy everything while you're sucking at the teat of all this collegiate money that these people are paying 30 years of their lives coming forward to listen to you and to adopt your ideas that aren't going to do them anything good. But to take that into account on, so one, it, one of the things we can do is also think from outside of the U.S. and act in here. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, and so the student repeats the question. It makes sense, but I feel like to explain all that to someone, they might already not want to hear that. I'm trying to engage with them, they already might not want to hear that. And, no, I get you. I get you. But as students, we should all, I mean, here, we should all engage with that. So I also wanted to add a disclaimer before I started the, the talk. It's just, this, this talk is not for everybody. People will shut down. People will stake their claim from the... Okay. Here, this is, this is the most important part of the whole video. Now, everything that comes before, we, I think we've all heard. And I think that, you know, I'm trying to get competent at critiquing everything that came before. And there's a lot of ideas there and stuff. But here is the center. The first thing he says is that this talk is not for everybody. This is where it goes away from a teaching model into a dogma. And it starts separating yourself, the people who are inside the clique, from those who are outside the clique. And he's been heading this already because he says, look at all the people who are inside the clique. All these white people are inside the clique. We need a clique of our own, basically. And what is a clique but a cult? What is a clique but a cult? And now he starts to describe how this cult is going to operate. That it's not for everybody and that you're not going to be able to basically convert everybody. But... I appreciate the honest racist who tells me to my face. All right. But we must be wary and even more afraid and ready for the liberals who say they are on our side and still espouse and act in this racist way and they say they're colorblind. Those are, the, are our foes. So his solution, his solution is to have more and more enemies. That's his solution. To have utter prejudice for the people who are actually trying to help you because they're not actually trying to help you because they want you to, I don't know, espouse these values that you think are evil. But I think that these values are what propels us forward. These values are what are going to make racism not even matter anymore. Make make racism, show racism, prove racism to be a shallow way of thinking. That's what these values that he despises, these progressive liberal values are already working toward on their own. Th that's the thing, and that's why he hates the progressive liberals, because those people are even more dangerous, because they're going to try to make you not be in this clique. They're going to try to make you see everybody as human beings first and foremost, and classes and categories second. And that doesn't work with this any more than it works with white supremacy. Therefore, this, this anti-supremacy is just another form of supremacy. And also, so that's a great point, right? So the reinvention, the internal sort of reflection that we have, the disruption in ourselves, and we become somebody new. That's what education does to us. It transforms us. It is painful. It is alienating. Alienating is we become somebody else, as you mentioned, but alienating it might take us away from those we love because they don't see the world. They, they're stuck in that way. And we're like so pained with that, right? That we have become somebody else and we are willing to take on the world. We are willing to smash white democracy or white supremacy. White democracy, white supremacy. This is the second thing. And I'm going to wrap it up here. This is the second thing that he says that, that shows this thing to be absolutely a vile ideology. What he's saying right here, right then, is that 
this education is going to alienate you from people who see the world differently than you. Going down this path is going to prove that everybody in your life is already complicit with white supremacy, and so you need to despise basically your family. This ideology will run division through every relationship in your life. And I guess, I guess in, a, in a way, he's not being disingenuous or in disingenuous. Somebody correct me on that. In a way, he's being absolutely authentic here and saying that, that once you adopt this cult-like way of viewing the world, everybody else is going to become your enemy, except for those who believe exactly how you believe. Because there's no room for thinking any other way. Because, and why? Why is that? I guess that should be a question that I should leave open. Why is it so important for this ideology to alienate everybody especially those who are kind of close to you on that political spectrum thing. Why are those your worst enemies? Why are your loved ones your worst, worst enemies? Why is a worldview more important than your family? That's kind of a downer for a New Year's Eve episode, um, but that's what I have for you today. I look forward to this new year. I hope you guys are looking forward to it too. Um, why don't you, you know, hang out, give this a like, give me a comment, tell me what I'm doing good, tell me what I can be doing better, um, and, and stay tuned. I have a whole lot of content coming up, and I hope to, um, well, I hope to actually become much better than I am now at what I'm doing here through this wavery shadow shadowy illusion sphere of the YouTubes. So, and other platforms perhaps, but the other platforms keep on failing. Uh, imagine that. Um, all right. Good night. Best wishes. Love you all.